Hi, this is Henry Monka from the Posit Science team. Today, we're going to be talking about the auditory training exercises in Brain HQ, and we're also going to talk about a set of randomized controlled clinical trials that show that these exercises can actually improve cognitive performance, including memory. Now, our co-founder, Dr. Michael Mersnick, is internationally famous for his work on auditory science, including the discovery that the adult auditory system is plastic and his leadership of the team that invented the cochlear implant and fundamentally cured deafness. Now, because of that core foundation on auditory science, these auditory brain training exercises were the first brain training exercises we built here at Posit Science. And as a result of that, they were the first exercises that we've taken in to randomize controlled trials. One of the trials we're going to be talking about today is particularly exciting. It's the IMPACT study, and it's the first large-scale, multi-site, randomized controlled trial of any broadly available cognitive training program. So let's dive in. We're going to start off with a problem. Brain performance peaks in our 20s. What we're looking at here is data that was collected by Tim Salthouse, who studied several thousand people aged 20 to 90 and measured their cognitive performance across a number of different cognitive domains. And you can see them here in the legend of the figure. Things like vocabulary, reasoning, spatial visualization, episodic memory, and perceptual speed. And if you look at the slope of these lines, going from people who are on the average age 20 to the average age of 90, they go down. And in fact, they go down in every single cognitive domain, with the sole exception of vocabulary. As we get older, we know more words. But whether it's memory, speed, spatial visualization, or reasoning, things on the average get worse. In fact, studies have shown us that peak video game performance occurs slightly before the age of 30. And in fact, even by the time we're 40, we can start to see cognitive decline on these measures. As we get into middle age, we frequently call it distractibility. And of course, senior moments start to emerge in our 60s and beyond. Now, this is pretty important data because, in fact, we now know that middle-aged cognitive performance actually predicts Alzheimer's risk. And in fact, a top concern of people 50 and older is maintaining their mental sharpness. And even though it's not shown on this graph, you're probably familiar with the idea that around 50% of people who are aged 85 and older actually, of course, have gone on to dementia. And you might ask yourself as you look at this graph, well, where are you now? And more importantly, where would you like to be in 20 years? And what we can say about this is this is not optimal aging. We should be able to do better. And when we founded Posit Science, that was our goal. Let's apply the science of brain plasticity and let's change the slope of these lines. So we're going to talk today specifically about verbal learning and verbal memory. Memory for the things that people say to you, like if your spouse asks you to go out and pick some things up at the store. And in fact, if you look at speech processing, it turns out that fast, accurate speech processing, which is of course required to remember something, requires a fast, accurate auditory system. What we're looking here at the left is spectrograms uh, that record the time and intensity of frequency of human speech of a person saying the word time on the top and a person saying the word kind on the bottom. Now these are confusable words. If you hear these in a noisy environment, you might mistake one for the other. And the reason they're confusable is, well, there's not actually that much difference in the spectrogram between time and kind. Really, the only difference is highlighted by those red circles. It's a little frequency modulated sweep at the beginning of the word. And what we can see from this is that speech has these very fast spectral and temporal transitions. And if your brain is going to process them correctly and not mix up time and kind, you're going to have to have a fast, accurate auditory processing system. And in fact, it's going to have to be fast and accurate on the time scale of 10 to 20 to 30 milliseconds. And if you have a noisy information processing in the auditory cortex, well, you might find it hard to tell whether time or kind is the word being said. And as a result, hearing rapid speech in noisy environments is hard, and in fact, storing that speech in memory is hard. So what happens if you don't have a fast and accurate auditory system? Well, that can lead to problems with speech reception, and in fact, the memory for speech. This was shown quite beautifully by a set of uh, studies led by Bruce Schneider and his team. And what they did is they looked at older and younger listeners and looked at the effects of adding different amount of noise during the presentation of words on a memory test. So on the left, what we're looking at is younger listeners in circles and older listeners in squares. And on the far left, we see their memory performance when a list of words was read to them in the quiet. And of course, older listeners have a worse memory than younger listeners on the average, as we might expect. 
And both groups are made worse by the addition of noise. So if that list of words is read in a noisy environment, both groups show worse performance on memory because, of course, the brain has more to do to decode those words in noise and then store them. There's increased cognitive load. So where this got really interesting is shown on the right. And what the researchers did here is they used noise to give younger listeners the functional auditory system of older listeners. And of course, the way they did this is they added more noise for younger listeners, because of course, younger listeners have better hearing than older listeners. Now, if you make the hearing equivalent in older and younger listeners, you can show that those people then have pretty much the same memory performance. You can see that in the levels for equivalent noise one and two there. And that's a fascinating observation, because what it tells us is that older people don't have bad memory exactly. The reason their memory looks worse than younger people is because they seem like they have additional noise in their system somehow. So if we can see that adding external noise makes cognitive performance worse, that might mean that older brains have an internal source of noise that's contributing to these memory problems. So at Posit Science, we decided to do something about that. We built a plasticity-based brain training program for people with a set of brain exercises that were focused on the auditory system. And at first, we built six exercises. Each one of these exercises was designed to improve the speed and accuracy of information processing in the auditory system. And the exercises were designed to work together to span the basic elements of speech reception so that those improvements in auditory processing accuracy would apply to everything from simple speech-like auditory features to people's ability to hear and discriminate consonants and syllables to their ability to hear and discriminate confusable words. And we eventually presented those stimuli with natural sentences and, in fact, even with some memory load. And our idea was that through each step of auditory processing in people, from the earliest steps all the way to language and memory processing, we wanted to improve the flow of information so that we would eliminate that source of internal noise and ideally improve memory performance. A key goal of the Brain HQ auditory systems overall is to improve the speed and accuracy of the auditory system so that a person has a better and faster processing of speech and then memory from speech. Here's how we do that with the sound sweeps exercise. When you do this exercise, you'll hear auditory sweeps. I'm going to start the exercise. We'll hear the first one. That was a sound that swept upwards from low to high. So we click the up button. Now we're going to hear a sweep that goes down. That sweep went from high to low. So I'm going to respond by clicking the down button. Next, we're going to hear a pair of these sweeps. The first one went up, and the second one went down. So why might a task like this be hard? Well, if a brain has a slowed auditory processing for any one of a number of reasons, it might not be finished processing the first sound before the second sound happens. And if the brain is still dealing with the first sound when the second sound happens, the brain might not be able to identify which sound was which, or might only be able to identify one of the two sounds, or might just hear the sequence as a single sound. In the field of perceptual psychophysics, this phenomenon is called forward and backward masking. The first stimulus masks the brain's ability to process the second stimulus, which is called forward masking, and the second stimulus masks the brain's ability to process the first stimulus, which is called backward masking. Put another way, every brain has to integrate information over space and time to detect signals. Some brains, due to aging or other conditions, are noisy, and to overcome that noise, they integrate information broadly over space and time. While that may help them detect a signal in the background of noisy brain information processing, it also means that those brains lose the fine detail of stimuli in space and time. For example, a brain with a noisy auditory information processor can integrate information too broadly in time and miss the fact that two auditory sweeps occurred, or be unable to identify which sweep was which. We can address this issue with the sound sweeps exercise. We start off with these sweeps very long and separated by a long interval. That makes the task reasonably straightforward to learn, even for someone who has a pretty impaired temporal auditory processing. Down, up. Up, down. Up, up. Down, up. Now you're probably already noticing that as I get these trials right, 
showing that my brain can operate at this particular speed, the exercise gets faster, making the sweeps quicker and reducing the interval between the sweeps. Down, up. These sweeps can get very fast and challenging even for high performing brains that have had enough practice. Down, up, 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 down, down. And of course if a person gets the trial wrong, the exercise backs off and slows it down so the person can get back on track. You can hear them getting slower, so now I can hear the first one is up and the second one is down. Of course, we want to train the brain across a variety of sweep frequencies and speeds so that the brain is ready for all the natural variety of sweeps that are found in normal human speech. So for example, if we skip ahead to stage four and start with the first level, we're gonna hear sweeps of relatively high frequency. as you can hear. And if we look at stage three on the first level, we'll hear sweeps of relatively low frequency. These frequencies are actually chosen so they span the normal frequencies of a wide variety of human speakers. By training across many of these stimulus variations, we can broadly improve the speed and accuracy of information processing for these kinds of stimuli. And of course, our goal in doing that is to ensure that the brain is ready to process real world information like fast, natural human speech. Now that we've seen how these exercises work, let's see what they do to cognitive performance. We started this research off with two distinct trials. However, they had some very common design features. Both of them were three-arm randomized controlled trials with a double-blind design, and in both of them, we enrolled healthy older adults, 65 and older. We asked the people randomized into the brain training arm to do 40 hours of brain training delivered over eight weeks. And then we had two kinds of control arms, and the first was an active control. We asked people to do 40 hours of uh, learning from educational DVDs. They watched things like Carl Sagan's Cosmos or Sister Wendy's History of Art. And at the end of each session, they actually took a quiz to make sure they were paying attention and had learned something. The other control group was a no contact control. They engaged in no cognitively stimulating activities from us over the course of the trial. For the assessment, we used a well-known standardized cognitive assessment called the Repeatable Battery for the Assessment of Neuropsychological Status, or the R-Bands. And because this was auditory training, we looked specifically at the R-Bands tests that measured uh, what your brain can do with things that you hear. Things like working memory for the auditory system, or verbal learning and recall, or memory for stories. We added those scores up and got a summary scale. In the first study shown here on the left, we actually ran this in classrooms. We worked with a large senior community here in the Bay Area called Rossmore uh, and enrolled 72 older adults into the study, randomized into those three groups. And what we saw was something pretty exciting, given this was the first study we had done. We saw that the improvement, as is shown in the y-axis here, on these R-bands auditory subtests in the Brain HQ group was statistically significant. People in that group showed higher cognitive performance at the end of training than they had showed at the beginning, with a pretty nice effect size, about 0.41 standard deviations. Whereas we saw some test-retest improvements in the active control and the no-contact control group, both of those groups, the improvement was seen was not statistically significantly different than zero. So that was a pretty exciting way to start. We went on to replicate that in a second study called the in-home study shown here on the right. Here we enrolled 161 older adults, same basic design, and in fact showed very much the same pattern of results. A statistically significant improvement in the Brain HQ group and a change that was not different than zero in both the active control group and the no contact control group. So this was exciting. Both these uh, uh, studies have been published as you can see at the bottom.
But I should point out that while we saw significant improvement within the trained group, which gave us hope that our auditory training exercises were improving generalized cognitive performance, neither of these studies were large enough to show between group significance. And if you remember your statistics from back in the day, what I mean by that is we were not statistically assured that that 2.3 point change shown on the right was statistically larger than the 1.0 change in the active control group, for example. So to sort that out, we needed to do a larger trial. That larger trial was called IMPACT, which stood for Improvement in Memory with Adaptive Plasticity-Based Cognitive Training. We had several main goals for the IMPACT study. The first were that we wanted to replicate the results we had seen already in a multi-site study with independent academic investigators. The next goal was to strengthen our statistical validation to demonstrate between group significance. We also wanted to assess multiple objective standardized measures of memory beyond just the R bands. And we also wanted to assess what are called participant reported outcome measures. Did this improvement in cognitive performance actually improve people's lives in a way that they noticed? And finally, we wanted to measure the persistence of benefits after the completion of training by doing a third set of cognitive tests well after people had finished. The impact study was designed as a gold standard randomized controlled trial and had a number of specific strengths, which I'll describe here. First of all, we worked with a set of independent investigators to conduct the study. There were two study principal investigators, Dr. Glenn Smith from Mayo Clinic and Dr. Elizabeth Zielinski from USC. And we also put together an independent data review committee composed of Dr. Christine Yaffe from UCSF, Dr. Ron Roof from Stanford, and Dr. Rob Kennison from CSU Los Angeles. IMPACT was a multi-site study, and what that means is that the results that we see in the overall data are not specific or peculiar to a single site because they've been combined from many sites, and in fact, as part of quality control, we can compare the results from different sites. IMPACT was a randomized study. Participants were recruited, then completed a baseline cognitive assessment, and then were randomized into intervention and active control groups. And this helps ensure that any between-group differences after training are truly the result of the intervention itself. IMPACT had an active control group. In this case, the control group engaged in an equivalent number of hours of cognitive stimulation, in this case learning from educational DVDs and taking pencil and paper quizzes after each DVD to make sure they had learned from it. And this active control helps ensure that any between group differences can be attributed to the specific properties of the intervention training program itself and are not just generic to being involved in the study or engaging in cognitive stimulation. Impact was also a double blind study. The people conducting the cognitive assessments did not know which group participants had been assigned to, which helps minimize unconscious bias. And participants themselves did not know which group was hypothesized to be more effective, and that helps minimize placebo effects. The way we did that is the consent form described the impact study as comparing two different forms of cognitive stimulation. So all that participants knew was they might get one form or the other form. They didn't know that the scientists involved believed that one might be better than the other. Impact also had a strong a priori statistical analysis plan. We predefined the primary outcome measure and we predefined the time point at which we would measure that outcome measure in advance. And that helps preserve statistical power and helps prevent p-hacking. And finally, Impact used an intent to treat analysis. We used linear mixed models to account for missing data due to dropouts over the course of the study. And that helps ensure that results are not affected by any characteristics of participants who didn't complete the study. So what assessments did we use? Well, we carefully designed the assessment battery to help us evaluate the generalization of benefits. And what I mean by that is that in cognitive training studies, it's nice to first of all ask the question, hey, do people get better at what they are actually training at? You might call that a train to the task assessment or a near transfer. And so, of course, in IMPACT, we were studying auditory processing. So we used an exercise-based assessment that measured auditory processing speed. And of course, we hypothesized that, hey, if people are practicing intensively on this, they should get better at it. Now, the core question we wanted to ask is one step up from that. If you improve at auditory processing, will those benefits generalize to standardized, untrained neuropsychological measures of cognitive function? Here, we used the R bands again, because we had data from the previous two studies showing promise. But we also extended that battery with a set of assessments that were designed to be more sensitive in healthy older adults. We used the uh, Ray Auditory Verbal Learning Test as a measure of verbal learning and memory. We used the Rivermead Behavioral Memory Test as a measure of narrative memory. And we used digit backwards and letter number sequencing from the WIMS-3 as a measure of working memory.
Finally, at the top of this ladder of assessments, we employed a novel participant reported outcome measure called the CIRC 25. The CIRC is simply 25 questions that ask people about their everyday cognitive performance. Things like, I can remember the names of people that I meet at parties, or I can hear what someone is saying to me in a noisy restaurant. And people simply rate these questions on a scale of one to five. And it lets us ask the question, if we see cognitive performance improvements as seen with the neurocognitive measures, are they big enough that people are actually noticing the difference in their everyday life? So what did we see? Well, we saw that the Brain HQ training, in fact, improved a standard generalized measure of cognitive function. We'll look at that in this graph on the left. We're looking at here the R-Bands Auditory Memory Index score. On the y-axis is that score, and it's measured on an IQ-like scale, where an average performance should have been around 100. The green bars on the left show us the performance of the Brain HQ group, pre-training and then post-training. The red bars show us the performance of the active control group, pre-training and post-training. And you can see this beautiful improvement in the Brain HQ group. They've improved by about 3.9 points on this scale. And while you see some upward movement in the control group as well, what the statistics show us is that the improvement in the Brain HQ group is statistically larger than it is in the control group. And that's significant at the P.02 level. And the effect size is quite nice, about 0.23 standard deviations of improvement. In fact, the cognitive improvement in the Brain HQ group at 3.9 points was more than twice as large as the cognitive improvement in the active control group. Now that's particularly interesting because the active control group here is not a placebo. We can't just give a sugar pill the way it would be done in a drug study. The active control group here actually did 40 hours of cognitive stimulation. They watched those videos. They answered those quizzes. But that did not help them as much as having the basic speed and accuracy of their auditory system be improved as it was in the Brain HQ group. Of course, what's also exciting is that these improvements are seen on a standardized, untrained measure of memory and attention. This isn't just getting better at the exercises themselves, this is getting better at actual cognitive performance. Furthermore, this improvement was seen in the a priori specified measure. And what that means is we called our shot. When we were writing the protocol, we said ahead of time that the R bands is the measure that we believe we'll see improvement on. That means we didn't dig through the data and find one thing that improved out of 20. We said that the training was going to improve the R-bands measure, and it did. Finally, the magnitude of the improvement is clinically significant. The effect size here was seen as somewhat over 0.2 standard deviations, and there's generally a consensus that if we're improving cognitive function that much, that's likely to matter in people's lives. Now let's dig into the data in a bit more depth. You remember that ladder of cognitive assessments that I showed you a slide or two ago. What did we see on all these things? On the left, we're looking at processing speed. This is the measure that I call the train the task measure. And of course, this is something that people practiced on directly. In fact, what this measure does, as you saw from the demo a moment ago, is it measures how much time has to pass between two brief auditory stimuli for a person to resolve those as two stimuli and be able to sort out which one came first. Now, if you look at the pre-training condition, what you'll see is that both the Brain HQ group and the control group, people required about 120 milliseconds or so to pass between two stimuli to sort out that there were two and which one was which. Now, I should say right off the bat, that's not a high-performing auditory system. If your brain requires 120 milliseconds to pass between two stimuli, you're going to be confusing words like time and kind. And put another way, you're only sampling the world at about 8 hertz, whereas speech requires you to sample the world much faster than that. After training, we see this dramatic improvement in auditory speed in the Brain HQ group shown in green, and really no change at all shown in the active control group. And that between group difference is highly significant with a large effect size at 0.87. Now that's exciting because it's exciting to show that older brains can dramatically improve their performance. But it's also kind of what we expected because the Brain HQ group was training at this. In the middle, we're now going to look at generalization of neurocognitive ability. Here we look at a composite measure composed of the RAVLT immediate and delayed measures, the RBMT immediate and delayed measures, and the working memory measures of digit span backwards and letter number sequencing. And again, this is an index score where an average person would score about 100. And if we look at the Brain HQ group, we see this beautiful improvement in cognitive performance as measured in this overall memory scale, and really almost no change at all in the active control group. And once again, the statistics show us that the improvement in the Brain HQ group is significantly larger than the improvement in the control group, 
uh, significant at the P.002 level, again with a very nice effect size of 0.3 standard deviations. Finally, on the right, we can look at everyday cognition with the questionnaire measure that I mentioned. This is an inverted scale, so lower scores are better. We see that, it, uh, again, a beautiful improvement in the Brain HQ group, whereas in the active control group, uh, there's no change or, if anything, a slight decline. And again, the improvement in the Brain HQ group is statistically larger than the change in the active control group, and now with an effect size of 0.33. Now, I'm not a horse racing man, but when we unblinded this data, I felt like we'd hit a trifecta. People improved at what they practiced at, and generalized to standardized measures of memory, and in fact, the improvements were important enough that people noticed them in their everyday life. Next, we asked the question, well, do these benefits persist after training is complete? And to do that, we conducted a third assessment three months after people finished training. We're looking at the same uh, outcome measures here now, processing speed, overall memory, and everyday cognition. But now on the right, during the follow-up visit, we show their performance uh, at that point. On the left, on our auditory processing speed measure, we see that at the follow-up point, there's still a very large statistically significant difference between the Brain HQ group and the active control group. In the middle, in the overall memory group, we see something kind of interesting. Both groups seem to actually continue to improve in the follow-up period. However, the advantage is still in favor of the Brain HQ group. We generally interpret this to mean that both groups are starting to get the hang of these neuropsych tests, and that's why they're showing somewhat better performance at the follow-up period. Finally, on our everyday cognition measure, we see that the benefits are largely maintained in the Brain HQ group. Uh, however, the active control group has bounced back a bit. What this result means is that the difference is no longer quite statistically significant. You can see the P.06 number up there on the top. However, this measure actually can be disentangled into three subscales, a hearing subscale, a social subscale, and a cognitive subscale. Uh, and in data that's shown in the publication, we actually see that the differences on the cognitive subscale are still significant at the follow-up period. So we generally interpret this to mean that the benefits are persisting after training is complete, but they're certainly beginning to wear off. And that's kind of reasonable because we think about brain training very much like we think of physical exercise. If you went to the gym for two months, you might see some benefits in your physical performance and your overall health. But sadly, if you stopped going to the gym, you could expect that those benefits would start to wear off. And we're pretty sure that brain training works very much the same way. And we're pretty sure that that's what this data is showing us. Now, after impact was complete, there have been several follow-on studies that have also used these auditory training exercises in healthy older adults. And I'm briefly going to mention two of them that were led by Samira Anderson and Nina Krauss. And these investigators were particularly interested in the effects of this auditory training on measures of hearing. And they did two studies. On the left, we're looking at 67 people who had normal hearing. And on the right, we're looking at a smaller sample of 28 people who specifically had hearing impairments. And these were both randomized controlled trials, both again with 40 hours of training, both compared the auditory training exercises to an active control composed of that DVD learning. But they used a somewhat different set of measures than we had used in impact. So at the top, what we're looking at is their performance in a speech and noise task called the quick sin, their ability to distinguish words in a noisy environment. So on this task, a lower score is better. We're looking at change scores here. On the left, we see that this nice improvement in the Brain HQ group, shown in green, and there's some change in the active control group as well, but the statistics show us that the improvement in the Brain HQ group is considerably larger than the improvement in the active control group at the P.004 level. Going down, these investigators also looked at a memory task, the Woodcock-Johnson short-term memory measure. Here, higher scores are better. Uh, and again, what you'll see is a beautiful improvement in the Brain HQ group and almost no change at all in the active control group, nicely statistically significant between groups. And they also looked at a processing speed measure off the Woodcock-Johnson 3, and again, improvement in the Brain HQ group and no change really at all in the active control group, statistically significant at the P.007 level. They extended and replicated these results looking at the hearing impaired population here uh, on the right and see very much the same pattern of things. This study was smaller, so I should point out that these statistics don't show us the between group differences um, that we've seen in previous studies. But in each of these measures, speech and noise, short-term memory, 
Uh, and in this case, they added an attention task using a cross-modal continuous performance task. We see that the Brain HQ group showed improvements, and there were really no changes in the active control group. So these are nice confirmations and extensions of the work that was done in IMPACT to show that the cognitive performance benefits are robust, and in fact that these benefits extend to also hearing function like speech and noise tasks. Now we can step back from this and say, well, what does it all mean? Does this mean that the auditory exercises in Brain HQ represent an effective cognitive training program? And the answer is yes. We can turn here to work that the Institute of Medicine did in 2016. We're in a very broad review of ways that people might maintain their cognitive function during aging. They recommended that a cognitive training program meet five basic requirements to show that it's effective. The first requirement is that the Institute of Medicine believe that a cognitive training program should show near transfer. People should get better at roughly the thing they practiced at. And of course we saw from the studies we've just reviewed that people in fact get substantially better at their auditory speed when they train on these exercises. The next requirement is that the training exercises show far transfer. You have to get better at things you didn't practice at that represent more real world measures of function. And of course, in the previous studies, we've seen that training improved standardized untrained measures of speed, attention, and memory. And we saw that training improved real world functions like speech and noise perception, as well as people's perception of their everyday cognitive function. The third requirement is that the benefits show some persistence. And of course, we saw that. We saw that the benefits were continued to be evident three months after the completion of training, but certainly had begun to wear off. The fourth requirement is that studies be conducted versus an active control. And in fact, all of the studies we've just shown you used a strong active control that made sure that people did not know whether they had been assigned to a treatment group that was supposed to benefit them or to more like a control group. Uh, and so we've met that requirement quite beautifully. Finally, the requirement is that the studies are conducted by independent investigators. And both in IMPACT, where we had independent academic investigators uh, working on us with the study, and in the follow-on studies in hearing, there have now been multiple studies conducted of these exercises by independent academic investigators. So having met all five of those criteria, I'm very comfortable saying that the auditory training exercises in Brain HQ are an effective cognitive training program. So to summarize, what have we seen? Well, we've walked through five randomized controlled trials, including a pivotal, large-scale, multi-site efficacy study, each of which has shown that the auditory training exercises in Brain HQ improve cognitive function in normal aging. These improvements generalize to untrained standardized measures of cognitive function, as well as to self-report and real-world measures of cognitive function. And it's important to note that these improvements are specific to these auditory exercises in Brain HQ. They're not general to cognitive stimulation or other kinds of cognitive training. And we know that because every one of these studies has used a strong active control. And we did not see those benefits in the active control group. And finally, uh, shows us that Brain HQ meets the requirements for an effective cognitive training program. Now, I've been involved in this research uh, from the day we started to build these cognitive training exercises to the day that we uh, saw independent investigators replicating these and publishing them. And it's been an incredibly exciting process for me to take this idea of brain plasticity from inception all the way to real world benefits. I hope that you've enjoyed walking through these studies with me today. I hope that you've learned something about how to run cognitive training trials and how to interpret data coming out of cognitive training trials. And most of all, I hope you take these benefits out and help the people around you with proven cognitive training. Thanks.